here there. Um, that's really our, our primary announcement for today. So um, today we're looking at Joshua chapter 23 and 24. Uh, last week we looked at the beginning of the book. This week we're looking at the end of the book um, and, and hopefully see uh, somewhat Joshua passed on to those who are left with him. So I was I was reading through this, deciding what to speak on this weekend, and um, really the just the the society we live in, the, the the culture we live in today that's so rapidly changing came to mind, and um, you know I've been been able to uh, travel all over. I'm curious how many have been out of the country. Just raise a hand. See a, a lot, right? That's um, it's it's amazing just how how small the world is in some ways, right? It's pretty big, but in other ways, pretty small. And we've been so mobile uh, here through COVID. Obviously, that's changed a little bit. But the overwhelming majority have been to other places in the world. Um, been fortunate throughout life just to go to to multiple places, really around the globe, and interact with people who who know and love the Lord. It's really something that God has used to encourage me is just seeing uh, different expressions of faith and church and different cultures and how the, the one name of Jesus really can bring people together in such a unified way. Uh, but at the same time, there's such different expression of that. Um, but of, of the, the many places I've been to, every single one of them, I think it's fair to say that uh, not one of those places was as accommodating to the gospel as right here in the United States, especially here in rural Ohio, right? I mean, it's uh, talk about uh, religious freedoms and just an open slate for, for ministry or for faith or for ministry strategies. I mean, it's, it's wide open. You can basically do anything. We can go to a street corner with a bullhorn and start uh, preaching the gospel or reading scripture. We could go door to door and knock on houses and start talking about Jesus and leaving Bibles and praying with people. Uh, most places in the world, that's not a reality or the, the, the sense of uh, the support of that uh, would not be there, right? So, so we've had this really globally speaking, this really unique environment spiritually where uh, it's, you're free to do what you want in, in, in a big way, right? Uh, and, and that's not true. So, but right now, the last 20 years or so, there's been a lot of change, right? The last 15 years, there's been a lot of change. And some people like to uh, put their, their finger on a, a certain individual that may, maybe has led some of that or certain issues that are at the top of the list as far as what's uh, shaping our culture. Uh, but nobody would deny there, there's a lot of shifting happening, radical change. I think I shared a few weeks back, I was reading, uh, somebody was writing just the, the fundamental change in values uh, they had never seen before, and all, all their uh, research of, of an entire society shifting fundamental values a, as quickly as we have. It's, it's really happened at, at breakneck speed for, for an entire country, right, that there's so much change that's happening. But for the majority of the world, um, the response probably is, welcome to the real world. You know, for, for us, a, a lot of what we see, I think, is uh, you, you sense this. People are tense. People are fearful. People are reactionary. People are angry. People are exhausted. But for the majority of the world, we're just headed towards something that's a normal reality for most people. Right? And, and I think what we see here in Joshua this morning, what I hope we'll see is these uh, kind of principles laid out that he's going to leave with the people. Uh, he, knows, he knows he's about to die, so he's kind of leaving his last words with the people. And I think what he's leaving with them is what God would have us receive as to how we should navigate this time, right? Um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit today, um, just how, how that can impact us as individuals um, and, and what it means for us to, to go through uh, times that are, that are changing, right? Uh, what does that mean for us? How do we navigate it? We're going to talk about that. Um, so let, let me pray for us. We'll, we'll jump in here at uh, Joshua 23, the very beginning of it. Let's pray. Well, Father God, uh, we just thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be together with others who know you and love you. And uh, Lord, I imagine this morning people all across the spectrum uh, 
sitting in this room, some with uh, big questions spiritually, some with some spiritual doubts and uncertainties, and uh, others that have been journeying alongside of you for years and years, and just uh, uh, in your presence, and and so grateful for it. So God, uh, you are the one who can speak into each person's heart in unique ways uh, through your spirit. So we're praying, God, that you would do that this morning, that you just open up our minds and our hearts to receive from you. And uh, Lord, we, we live in this time where uh, so many things are changing, and it seems just the, the general stress levels of, of people in our nation and our nation on a whole uh, has increased. Uh, but Lord, we are uh, a people uh, who are to be set apart for you and by you. So Lord, we just pray that you'd show us a little bit this morning uh, how we should be navigating these days uh, as individuals, as families, as a church. Uh, so we give this time to you and ask you to use it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So let's just start uh, 23, 1 through 3. Um, a long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and Joshua's old and well advanced in years... Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, and he said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Okay, so uh, these verses here are really just setting the stage a little bit, setting the, the climate for what was happening there spiritually, right? Uh, Joshua, beginning, beginning here, notes that... Um, a long time afterward. So uh, this is a long time after they had come into to Canaan, right? Last week we looked at the crossing of the Jordan, and they've now settled into Canaan. Remember, uh, you know, he's call, calling all the, the elders and the officers. This isn't just a, a nation of Israel as we would think of it. This is a land of Canaan, very broad, uh, with 12, 12 different tribes of Israel that are scattered all throughout. Right? And, and we saw a little bit earlier, chapter 22 talked about three of these tribes who actually settled in on the other side of the Jordan, which I think is interesting. There's a, a different message there uh, about God's willingness to let these three tribes, I think it was Manasseh, Reuben, and Gad, they went to the, the east side of the Jordan uh, because the land was so nice for all their crops. They had big herds, right? Uh, so they wanted to raise them up. All the people are coming to Joshua and, and they're probably settling into this point. It makes note to say that their enemies had kind of uh, stepped back a little bit. Uh, so I imagine it's fair to say that religiously, spiritually speaking, the climate had really cooled, right? It, it's pretty safe. God can be worshipped there. They can express themselves freely. And what were the, what were the main warnings that Moses would give? And you think about uh, the book of Deuteronomy and, and some others leading up to the, the Israelites going into Canaan. The number one warning he gives is, don't forget. Don't forget the Lord. Right? When you step into these houses that are fully furnished and you drink from these wells that have already been drilled and, and you have uh, the, the fruit flowing abundantly, like you have everything that you need, don't forget the Lord when you get in this place of comfort. Now, that's where I, I think we could see some parallel maybe, you know, in, in our existence and their existence. Uh, let's not forget when we have all this comfort or freedom of expression, what God uh, who God really is, who, who has really brought this about. Uh, it says Joshua is old, uh, no joke there, 110. So he's seen some things, right? He, he, he really came up under Moses. Uh, he, he was the one set in charge for Moses. And, you know, what a beautiful thing to, to probably see his journey of staying in the faith, uh, of leading for God and all of Israel going to the feet of a man who's 110 years old to hear his wisdom uh, before uh, he passes away. Just a, a powerful thing there. So we kind of get that, the spiritual environment. Um, it had been a while. They're settled in, and Joshua has some things to say. So let's see what he says here. What's he leave with the people? Verse 6, Therefore, be very strong, to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. So he acknowledges God has given you all this stuff. Here's my parting words, the most important words you might have, right? Therefore, be very strong. Interesting, he says that. If you remember the last week, chapter one, what did God tell Joshua three times over? Be strong. 
be strong, be strong. He's now 110 years old. The first thing he leaves with the people, be strong. You, th- you think that's, that's been a, a theme throughout the life of Joshua? Uh, how, how about for us today? Where's our strength coming from? You, you sense some pressures. You sense some, some temptations maybe you didn't experience before. Be strong, right? Be strong to keep, to keep. Uh, if you remember back maybe a few months, uh, really towards the beginning of the year, we were looking at Adam and Eve in the garden, and they were given a command, you might remember it now, to keep. The Hebrew word used there was shamar. We talked about shamar. Keep the ground is what God told Adam and Eve in the garden. Keep it. Exact same word, shamar, is used here. Joshua is passing that on to the people. Keep what you see in the book. That's, that's cultivate it, right? Uh, protect it. Handle it with care. It's a gift. Just as the garden was a gift, care for it, tend to it, keep what you see here in the book. So be very strong to keep and to do. Do it. You don't just know it. We don't just receive it. We do it. We put it into motion, right? And and this is talking about the book, the law. It's a gift from God, Right? This, this law has been given by God to his people as a resource. He's saying, now that you have it, you have to keep it, and you have to do it, put it into practice. And, and really, we could, uh, for translation here, to, to get us to the New Testament, because this was a long time ago, right? We think of the book of the law. We think of the book of Moses, the Ten Commandments. Uh, but we've come, and come quite a ways uh, after Jesus came, right? The, there, the nation would be looking forward to this Messiah who came, who's Jesus, and the fullness of God, right? He embodies all of who God is and, and lived the law perfectly, didn't turn from it to the right or to the left a single time. He didn't deserve what was brought to him, but he died on a cross, was raised three days later, and now is seated at the, the right hand of God so that every name would be able to profess that Jesus is Lord. And the idea here is Jesus is the full embodiment of the law, right? Right? Uh, scripture talks about that. Uh, wrote down one verse. Romans chapter 10 talks about it. It says, Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Christ is the telos of the law. That's the end. He's the end point. Fulfillment. Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly. It's embodied in the person of Christ. Right. So, so for us, translation today would be uh, that, that we would keep... And do all that we see embodied in the person of Christ. The Spirit of God that's living in Jesus would be residing in us and that we would be fostering that. That we would be cultivating that and caring for it and keeping it and doing it. And Jesus had the exact same teachings. In Matthew chapter 7, we see this example where uh, Jesus says, uh, the, the wise man is uh, anyone who hears my words and does them. It's like a wise man who built his house upon the rock, and the winds came, and the waters came, and it blew really hard, but the house stood because it was strong, right? Anyone who, does, anyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand, and the winds came, and the waters rose, and the, and the storm came, and the house had a very large crash. It broke down. You might say that spiritually speaking, the spiritual climate and the culture in which we live, there's a little bit of a storm happening. <laughs> some, some pressures coming, some temptations coming, some, some questioning coming to, to the people of God, right? What do we do? Well, Jesus says, hear my words and do them, and you're a wise man who built his house upon the rock. He maybe got that idea from his father who was downloading to Joshua, keep the book and do it too, Right? The book of James talks more about that, uh, the idea of doing the law, not just receiving it, but we put it into practice. So Jesus embodies that. Uh, we really just abide in him, would be New Testament language. Uh, why, why does this happen? Why is Joshua laying this out? You look at verse 7, a little bit further down. So be strong. Keep and do all that's written in the book of the law of Moses. Don't turn from the right or the left. Verse 7, 
so that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them so that you may not mix. It's, remember meta-narrative here, we're talking about that this, this year, the, the big story of God. He's, he's set apart this people. He started with Abraham. He chose Abraham to be a blessing to all the nations, and Abraham was going to be the, the father of this nation uh, that grew up to be a, a remnant of people in the world. And, and in the Old Testament, God is ferociously guarding the holiness of this people so that they're set apart from the world. Because they are the people who have this presence of God that can point people to God. If they start mixing and it becomes watered down, there's really no boundary line there between the people of Israel and the people of the world. But the people of Israel are meant to be the ones who show what God is like. So you can't start mixing. There's, there's no offer that's unique. It's the same for us today. We don't want to start mixing. And it's interesting to see that a lot of this first round of, of information from Joshua is pretty inward focused, right? Leaning in to, to what's central, the book, the book of the law. It says, uh, in, in the, I think it was verse 7, cling to the Lord. Like you're clinging, you're reaching in. That's, for, for a church, I think it's showing like, primary point of emphasis is our church family, that we are clinging to the Lord, that we are leaning in. So right now we, we talk about services, one service or two service, and, and what do we do with that? Uh, the decision for one service over two service is more than uh, just convenience for people or, or what makes sense. Like it, It's a cultural time that we're navigating that's different than we've ever experienced before. So we feel there's some value to being together and clinging, and knowing, and building a relationship. It was interesting. I talked this week uh, to a, a pastor in, in the Alliance. It was your pastor, actually. And, and he, said, um, he, he said, you know, I think the, the days of the megachurch are gone. So in the 90s, the megachurch came, and there's thousands of people. And, and really, they just had uh, a lot of really good leaders come in and could get a lot of people. And because we lived in this culture that uh, you can just, you know, the culture would almost disciple your kids in a way that honored God. As far as Christian values, right? You didn't have to worry too much. But he's saying, I think the day the megachurch is gone, I think the church of the future is 200 to 500 people. And the primary things are going to be options and intimacy. And a church of 200 to 500 people can offer a lot of options, but they can also offer some intimacy. You, know, you get down below that, and you don't get some of the options that a church can offer. And we'll see how that plays out, but it does seem to make sense as you read the culture and, and the narratives of what's happening that if we're going forward and becoming a, a nation where the, the primary bedrock for spiritual things isn't the Christian church, that those gatherings are going to become a little bit smaller and more intimate because they're going to have to cling harder to each other. That's what you see around the world. If, if the, the other nations are any indicator as to being a, a minority religion or a minority people, the gatherings are probably going to shrink, but they're going to become more intimate. We want to lean into that, preserve that intimacy uh, that we see. Verse 9 and 10 uh, talks about the Lord fighting your battles. So the idea, we stay focused. We, we do what we need to do. And there might be accusations made, there might be misunderstandings, there might be temptations. We stay focused. We just continue marching on, and we trust that God is going to take care uh, of those battles as we go. So our society, uh, going through rapid transition, the values of our nation, the beliefs of our nation, really epistemology and the way we evaluate knowledge and our sources of knowledge, like what is, what is a source of truth? That's changing in the minds of our young people, right? It's not the book, is the idea of society. It's not God. Really, sources of truth now are coming from within a person. It's much more relevant. So you do what you want to do, or you follow uh, what you think is right, right? This idea of an absolute truth that's external and sitting over all things, that's, that's being pushed aside. So our, our culture is rapidly changing, and, and we're trying to navigate through those times. So what we see, you know, I wrote down here, it's like a spiritual earthquake is happening. 
everything's just rocking around. And that's, not, that's true for Protestants. It's true for Catholics. It's really true for, for all religions. They're reevaluating because things are being questioned in the way people think about what is true. So what we see are, peer, are people scrambling. We see churches scrambling. We see whole denominations scrambling. And, and what they're doing in, in large part, many times, they're kind of leaning into the changes of society to see what they might be able to graft in in order to stay relevant and effective. So everything around us is changing so rapidly that now to cling to an old uh, uh, historical Jesus, historical presentation of God's word, it's becoming more and more radical and therefore more and more uncomfortable, right? So we start leaning in because we don't like feeling that uncomfortable. It's painful. It's weird. Who wants to be called a bigot? (laughs) Or disrespectful, right? We don't like that, so we start leaning into the things of the world. We start mixing a little bit to stay effective, to stay relevant, to keep people coming. You're in ministry. You want to draw people together. And now young generations just aren't coming. What do you do? You start adapting your strategies, your philosophies. Right? And in the church and God's people, over the history of time, uh, there's, and, and this is true for individuals, it's true for families, it's true for churches like ours, it's true for whole denominations. There's wisdom, there's strategy, there's contextualization, but there's also sin where it goes too far and you start to compromise. Right, so contextualization, we just, we just redid our whole church facility. We want people to walk in and, and to know that, hey, uh, we, we're up to date with the times, and, and we actually have a desire to move into the future, and, and we care for our kids, and we want to communicate that, right? But there can come a point where strategy and contextualization become sinful, and you really start mixing, and that's what, that's what starts happening. People start breaking off. So what's Joshua say? Keep and do all that's written in the book. Don't swerve to the left or to the right. Preserve what's in the book. Cling to it. Focus. You know, there's a, a story. I think there's a chance somebody shared this story from the pulpit like a few weeks ago. So if, if it sounds really familiar, I forget who, who shared this, but um, you, you might recognize it. But there, there's an illustration, uh, I think, from what I saw online this week, it's, it's from a, a, a Hindu tradition. And there's this farmer who owns a, a, a big farm, and he needs to hire a farmhand. Okay, so he starts taking applications, and, and the farmhands start coming, and, and, and he gets this one farmhand who's truly interested, and he can stay with the farm. And, and he seems to work pretty hard, but he also likes to sleep. He says, you know, I, I like my sleep. In fact, I can sleep through a storm. Is this familiar? If not, that's good. Okay. <laughs> I can sleep through a storm. All right? So, so he's bragging about his sleep. And the farmer, he's like, man, I don't know about this. Like, the guy works hard, but he likes to sleep. It sounds a little bit lazy, maybe. And, but no, nobody else comes to apply for the job. So he takes this farmhand, and he hires him. He hires the farmhand, and, and he's been there for a few months, and, and he's doing all right. He does sleep a lot, uh, but he's, he's taking care of the farm. And then one night, big storm comes. Rain is just pouring. Wind is blowing, right? Uh, lightning, thunder, all of it, just huge storm. And that farmer's sitting in there. He's worried because he knows uh, the day before how much the farmer was doing. There was hay out in the field. He had his equipment out. All the barn doors were opened up. He's like, this guy's probably sleeping through the storm. Everything's going to be a mess. So he wakes up, and he's furious, and he goes straight to get the farmhand, and he says, hey, we got to go outside and check this out. And he goes out there. He's expecting to be all upset with the farmer or the farmhand, and, and all of a sudden, he's a little bit surprised. He realizes all the hay's put away. The barn doors have been latched up. they got an extra bolt in them. All, all the materials, they're all put away. He even went so far as to close the shutters on the house to protect the people in the house. He's like, oh, wow. He he says, what did you think? I told you I could sleep through a storm. I can sleep through a storm because I'm prepared. He knew what was coming. 
He prepared ahead of time, sleeping easy. That's all he could do is prepare. It's the same principle at play here with God and his people. How many times did Jesus talk about that? We don't know when Christ is returning, but he's going to return, but stay ready. Keep your wicks trimmed, right? Joshua, cling to the Lord. He says, as you have up until this day, cling to the Lord. Keep the book and do the book. That's all we can do. We just keep our, our nose to the grind, as they would say. We, we do our thing. We continue to preserve and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. The book is not changing unless we want to take a seat of authority over top of it and start twisting some things around. It's not changing. We continue to hold to the book, and we'd be ready for the storm. And anyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man, and he built his house upon a rock. And the winds came, and the waters rose, and it blew across the house, and it stood. The church of Jesus Christ cannot be defeated. We don't need to worry. We don't need to fear. We don't need to be reactionary in our responses or in panic mode as if we need to solve something because nothing that belongs to God can be taken. It's his promise. He's faithful. So what's happening now, there's all this change in society and there's rapid change and, and, and everybody gets a little leery and some of that for good reason, but there's a lot of panic but, but really, I would say it's just like, it's like the whole thing's being shaken, right? But it's just sifting away the chaff. Because any, anything that belongs to God is going to remain intact with what God has. So there's a lot falling off, and there's a lot falling away, and, and there's some things that are taking new dynamics, and, and it looks different from the inside. But uh, really, it gets to what's talked about here in, in the, the second part of this, verse 11, 23 verse 11. So he had talked about keeping the book. And then 11, I think this is interesting. Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. That was kind of a second command. Keep to the book so you don't mix. Second part of what Joshua says, be very careful to love the Lord. I think that's interesting that he's commanding or telling the people, love the Lord. Like, Can you force love? In some ways, you can, actions of it that foster it, right? You, you, you might not be able to initiate the, uh, the initial desires or emotions. I think that comes from God. But there is, is this point of do what, do what we know is an expression of love to God, even when it might not make sense to us, even when we feel like we don't really want to or we're mad at him. And where was he two weeks ago? When that happened, has he abandoned me? We can continue to do these expressions of love to God. Be very careful that you love the Lord. You know, this year we're doing this through the Bible in a year. We call it uh, Focus. And, and the subtitle uh, of this through the Bible in a year uh, was Growing Our Love for God Through a Better Understanding of Scripture. And, and this text didn't really inform that, but what a, what a great parallel there where it ties together growing our love for God through a better understanding of Scripture. Now, in that conversation, there was conversation about, I know we don't see that a lot, but uh, we, we do talk about it and, and choose those words uh, specifically. We want to foster love, not just knowledge. If we all read through the Bible and we just know more about Him, that doesn't necessarily bring heart change. But I jotted down uh, this week, leaders who are working to cultivate love lead differently than those who lead to cultivate obedience, compliance, or success, right? It, it, we're not just cultivating uh, obedience as it appears on the outside. We're not, we're not cultivating just to, uh, to have people or, or to follow. We're cultivating, a, hopefully, Lord willing, love for the person of God. Because once that love takes root, you join into the multitudes of people who've had their heart and mind transformed in such a way that they can look at the work of God and do what we see here uh, a little bit later on, maybe the, the best statement in this, 2314. And now I'm about to go to the way of all the earth. You know in your hearts. So those who have love for God, you've experienced his love. You've experienced the power of the Spirit in your life. 
He, he's speaking to you here. He, he's got the, the elders and the officers from all Israel, right? The, the spiritual heads are here uh, with Joshua. He says, I'm about to go to the way of all the earth. I'm about to die. And you know in your hearts and in your souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised. There's a, a remnant of people in the world who can look at life and no matter what happens, the good, the bad, the beautiful, the ugly, everything in between, they can look at that and they can step back and say, you know what? Through it all, he's good. A couple weeks ago, President Stumbo was up here. He talked about uh, his physical illness. And you remember that video he showed you standing before the congregation in his church he didn't know what the end was going to be. He didn't know how the end of the story was going to be written yet, whether he was going to live or he was going to die. So he was stepping down from the pulpit because he couldn't sustain it. And what's he say? God is good in the midst of it. Now, there's only certain people in this world that can have uh, the storms of life thrown at them. And in the midst of it, they still say, not one word has failed. Because it's easy to flip that on its head and say, Lord, forget you. Where were you? Where were you at that time? You didn't love me. But when, when the Spirit of God and the book has taken root in somebody's life and that's present there, then you can look at that and still uh, see his faithfulness. Um, I'll, I'll close with this. Helen, putting you on the spot. Helen's going to turn 100 years old July 7th. hundred years old. Praise God for it. Uh, maybe she should be up here giving this message today, <laughs> right? She's seen a lot of things. Uh, I was at her house not too long ago. Uh, her son was getting cancer treatment, and she's seen some other hard things along the way. But in the midst of it all, Helen, is God good? God is good. He's good, Right? He's, he's transformed her mind and her heart. Story's over. He's good. There's no, other, there's no other option. He's faithful through the ups and downs. Talk about Helen if you want to hear about some ups and downs. He's good. He's faithful. This is what Joshua's saying. Keep the book and do what it says and be very careful to love him. That's in individuals' lives. It's in families' lives. Now, more than ever, we got to be careful about leaning into the styles of society or culture, but leaning in to one another. It's just like uh, Scripture says, the, Satan's like a, a, a lion who's prowling around waiting for somebody to devour, right? I, I, watched, a, I watched a lion once going to uh, attack some zebras at the, the river, and it was out in the wild. You could see this lion coming across this hill. The zebras had no clue he was there. He, all these zebras were here. And, and you know which, which zebra is about to get attacked. And I'm sitting there, this is going to be good. Like, this is going to be, see what happens here. That lion comes across, and sure enough, he went for the one that decided to go downstream a little bit. Right? He wants the one who's hanging out. Church, we're headed towards a culture and a spiritual environment and a reality when our ability to go downstream by ourselves is a lot more dangerous than it used to be. And that's especially true for our kids. Now's the time to lean in to the book, to the presence of God, and let him work through that so that we're ready. And when you're ready, you don't have to worry. Personally, looking at all this stuff that's happening in the country... I don't know. I mean, we need people to advocate. We need people to stand up about it. But I, I do my best to not lose sleep over it because God's in charge, right? So I want to close just with a, a little time in prayer uh, for our church family, uh, just for, for all of you, and um, then we'll be done. Father God, uh, we thank you for your word, and we do believe it to be true, Lord. So we pray that uh, you would help us uh, to keep it uh, and, and to understand what that means, to keep it. And not just to, to keep it, but uh, 
that we would do it. And beyond that, that our, our keeping and doing of your word would just lead us into a, a deeper relationship with you, that we could love you and know you, and that we would be a church family that's, that's marked by loving um, you. Um, greatest commandment, love the Lord your God. Uh, the second one is like it, that we would love one another. Uh, so just pray that we would be marked by your love, but at the same time, uh, bold and courageous and strong uh, to stand up against the, the ways of the enemy and the temptations that come with it. Uh, so God, we want to give this church to you. Uh, we give our future to you. It's yours. Uh, we thank you that the gates of hell cannot stand up against uh, your work in this world and that um, those who belong to you are, are, are with you uh, forever. So we thank you for your love and your faithfulness. Uh, Lord, for those who are uh, navigating life on their own and they're feeling the weight of that, I pray that you might bring them into the fold of your people, uh, that they would have a place for rest. That's what Joshua says. They, they found their place of rest. We pray, God, this would be a place of rest. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing, Your Grace is Enough, meaning we can rest in your faithfulness, God. We don't have to create our own way out of fear. Rest in his grace together. Let's worship him. If you need prayer for anything, 
resting in the Lord today, resting in his grace, his faithfulness, maybe loving, leaning into the Lord, loving him again. Come forward. We'd love to pray with you.